All right. So today we are going to do um, Demeter, the mother. And I myself said that I was really surprised at what a maternal instinct I had. Uh, and I had to move away from my daughter. And that was 25 years ago. And so I just found out in three months, I can move back to Minnesota. So I'm happy I can be near my son and all that. So that's gonna be really nice. Um, so we have, we have today and three more days on this book, and then the book will be finished and we're gonna move into patriarchy. And then <clears throat> you are required to write a more formal paper. And that paper will be about um, the goddesses in your life, right? How, which ones you think you've been possessed by so far in your life, and then what you anticipate, right? So for example, I had a student and um, she said, she thinks given her childhood, she was quiet, but she was independent minded. So she was like Hestia, but what she wants to do with her life is start an environmental organization. So she's going to have to push herself to be more aggressive like Artemis and more managerial like Athena. So you can just sort of juggle all these different goddesses and see, um, sort of anticipate, look at your past, your present, your future. And that that's what your paper would be about. You can also include in it something like, um, I never had any idea that this was what this material was about and that it's supposed to be used to teach people how to live, right? So you can make, you can have a, a paragraph about that. It could be at the beginning or the end. Um, anyway, so if you want, I am requiring a conference with me, individual conference. And I will also post the core, there's a sheet, uh, standard core program requirements for a paper. So I don't have my own requirements. I just use the standard. And I will worry more about your writing than I have so far. So far, I don't know if I've graded anybody down because of their writing. Maybe a few students, but I know that that's, that's some of you come in a lot better prepared. So it's not your fault. But if you are one of the less prepared students, I would be happy to work with you. Um, I do try to rewrite your papers and you can think about, okay, how could I do that next time? I do want to tell you that I've done a lot of writing. And when I'm originally doing it, I love my ideas. They're totally clear. And then I go back a week later and I go, oh my gosh, you know, run on sentences and they're just not nearly as clear as they were at the beginning. So don't think, you know, that there's something wrong with you it, when that happens, because it happens to absolutely everyone, no matter how much they've written. So it's a discipline to sort of make yourself what am I really saying, right? And, and that's hard, it's a discipline. But um, I've tried, I really just want you to think about the power of these ideas. So I haven't emphasized that, but this is a writing seminar and I do wanna help you get your writing better because if you all want to have a good professional job and for better or worse, you do have to know English well and you do have to write English well in order to be successful. So I definitely want to help you. So um, I will start. You can make individual appointments with me for conferences at any point. But if you want to wait till we finish the book, uh, that's fine. And then we'll start in and it'll be just about a week there. 
to make the appointments and then I'll give you another week or so to actually write the paper. But we'll already be moving on and covering patriarchy by then. So um, just try to pace yourself, figure all that out. Uh, let's see. And if you have questions on that, just put them in the chat and I'll check it during the group meeting. All right, so the first thing is some woman you know, either someone you know personally or someone in the public eye who was either a really positive mother type or the dark side, right? She became controlling or all those other things when it goes too far. Um, so Poppy, go ahead. We want to hear what you have to say. I want to say about my mother, because my mother is always, you know, uh, she is thinking about positive, not uh, negatively. Um, you know, in our community also, there are some women uh, uh, talking about me when I um, when I came in outside for the study and they, they always comment, it's not good for the uh, um, women or it's, uh, um, you know, um, that time my mother told her those uh, kind of uh, women, uh, <clears throat> it's not like that always because uh, she she want to a uh, success in her life. So uh, she, uh, she, she need to go outside and she need to uh, do a study and uh, higher education. So I always, uh, you know, um, my mother yeah. is always a positivity and uh, she always helped me to uh, try to success my uh, life also. So, yeah. Very good, Poppy. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Lakin. Hi, so the example that I thought of was my best friend's mom. She's just a very, very like motherly figure or like maternal figure. She's very caring and nice. And like she's always helping injured animals and wanting to adopt animals and stuff like that. Okay. Is she, um, is she a mom that encourages the independence of her kids or does she hover over them too much or any of those, you know? Um, yeah, I think she is kind of a helicopter mom. <laughs> okay. Does everybody know what that means? Is that just international language? It, it means the hovering type, right? Like a helicopter, so. Um, I remember when I first heard that expression, uh, my brother was that way with his kids. When they went to college, they were just on the phone all the time, so. Um, Claire. Um, I chose my mom as well. I thought that the just natural instincts of a mother came into play for her. She enjoyed and still does enjoy her role as a mother and puts everything into that. And I also thought that the part about how they're not just concerned about the well-being, like physically or just growing up, but emotionally and the role they play in that. And that's definitely been my mom. Okay. Um, Madeline. I chose my, uh, my, my good friend Liliana's mother, Jessica. Uh, she's She's a single mother, but she does everything for her for her children. Absolutely loves them. She's kind of like a mother to me as well. Uh, she does kind of have an overprotective side to her that she does kind of hover over the choices that her children make, but she's like a fantastic woman. Uh, Louis. <clears throat> yes, Professor, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I actually I bring an example of my neighbor, but I think it's not an example of a single woman, but I think it's very zen for women situation in general in like in Vietnam society. Um, my neighbor, he had to quit her job after giving birth 
because she could not bear the burden of housework, childcare, like and caring her in-law parent at the same time, like all the work that Vietnamese wives are expected to do. So she could consider hiring babysitter, but like it co it cost two thirds of her salary, and she also doesn't feel secure when she gave baby for the babysitter, because in Vietnam, uh, there were many cases of child of child oh, violence oh. happen. Um, she told me that sometimes she feel less stressed and boring because she have to sacri sacrifice her career, which she took many years to build for, and insta instead staying at home with domestic surgery most of the time. But they no other option. Like she have to do that to take care of the children. So then I look at the women around me. They almost them after giving birth. They have to choose between take care of, take care of family and career. Um, there are two typical cases, I think. The first one is quit the job, like my neighbor. And the second is they have to like hide the babysitter or ask their parent to take care of the baby. Uh, in both options, I think women still have to handle a lot of work, both in the workplace and at home. Like when, when they choose giving birth, more or less they have to pay up something. Yeah, this is in my big name, in my country. Okay. Even in the US, women do working moms end up having two shifts. Uh, hardly ever is it equal. So uh, it'll take a while. Okay, Arifa. Uh, professor, I wanna talk about my cousin. Uh, she is really kind and always thinking about their future of children. Uh, and two years ago in hospital, one woman gave a birth and then she left her child in hospital. Then my cousin, uh, she take care of him. And she is now, I think, 20 years old. Uh, she loved him like uh, her uh, children and she take care of him. Uh, uh, she, uh, uh, she is like uh, same her children. How many children does she have? Uh, one a daughter and a three sons. Okay, good. Elizabeth. So for my examples, uh, I also brought my mom, but for a little bit of a different reason. Um, she stayed married to my dad, even though she wasn't happy in the marriage because she wanted my brother and I to grow up with two parents. And she didn't want to put that pressure of having divorced parents on us because her parents were divorced. So she knows from experience that it can be hard. So she didn't want her kids to grow up with that kind of pressure. Um, I also brought another example, just like a public woman. Um, I think Melania Trump is also could be a Demeter woman because she stayed with her cheating husband for her son. Um, she kept her son out of the spotlight so he could have a relatively normal life growing up. You don't hear a whole lot about Baron Trump in the news and all of that. And I think she did that so he wouldn't grow up with this pressure on him to be you know, famous or be always perfect or something. She wanted him to have a pretty normal life. <laughs> if that's possible. And is it... as, much, as much as it could be possible, yeah. I know, um, okay. Um, Jereen. I would like to pass. Okay. Dr. Beck, do you want Sam to go now too? Since she's- Oh yeah, the sorry. Sorry. Go um, ahead, so for my example of a Demeter uh, woman, I'm actually gonna talk about uh, my boyfriend's John's moms. He has seven mothers, um, mother figures. Um, basically a group of lesbians that all <laughs> raised him. Um, and so all of them very like individually care for him and really demonstrate a Demeter woman uh, or Demeter archetype because they care for, protect, educate, they discipline John, you know, they take care of him. Um, two of his moms are helicopter moms. You know, they're very protective. They want to know what he's doing all the time. 
they try to influence his train of thought a lot. Um, but the other five moms are actually really open and carefree, but they also demand a lot of independence from him and stuff. And so he doesn't really get a free ride with any of them. But um, so yeah, I just think all of them, all of them are Demeter women. So, and you know, there's seven of them raising one kid, so. Do they all live near each other? They live, uh, they live near each other. The furthest one lives like two hours away, but he sees them every weekend. So they're not like, it's not like he spends one weekend at one house and one at the other. He lives with Lindsay, his biological mother, the one that gave birth to him. She, or he lives with her all the time, but he goes and visits all the others over the weekends and stuff. All right. So Jareen, you said you were going to pass. Okay. Um, Nahida. Yes, Professor. Uh, yes, I know a neighbor uh, who gave birth to twin child and th those twin child was autistic. People used to scold her mother, their mother and mocking at her child. But as a mother, she's very beautiful. And she even did not upset about the staffs. She never neglected them and take care of them constantly. I think she's a woman that reflects her as a real mother. What does she do that she gets criticized for? For her child, uh, uh, they're autistic and uh, why? Uh, actually, I don't think, I don't know about people's mentality, but they used to do it. Why, why they do it, I don't understand. Because they like their artistry, is that what you said? I just have our time. Autistic, they're artistic. Oh, autistic. Okay, sorry. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, News Rot. Uh, yes, Professor. Okay, so uh, for this class, I, I would share one of the a story of a woman who uh, who is like popular in the public eye and uh, I read a book uh, of one of the author, a renowned author named Anisil Hawk and the book name was Ma which means mother so uh, it is about a true story uh, in that happened in Bangladesh so the story is about uh, one of our freedom fighter named Dajad and his mother, uh, Ajit was the only son of his mother. And uh, Ajit's mother was like really anxious about his father because she doubted that uh, his father was engaged with another woman. So after a few years, uh, she uh, doubt, uh, like her doubt turned into truth and uh, Ajit's father married second time another woman. So Ajit's mother immediately left her home uh, with his only son. That time, uh, Ajit was only a kid. So his mother was very tenacious lady. Uh, she was determined never to return that home and uh, never to take any uh, like financial support from her husband. She struggled all her life to raise her son and uh, in her own way, but never gave up. Uh, Ajad knowing all like about his mother's sacrifices and uh, the struggle, he always wanted to write about her mother, his mother. Uh, but like later on, when the independence, uh, like liberation war happened in Bangladesh, he got involved in it. And uh, her mo his mother uh, gave other marchers, like Ajad's friends, shelter, food, and most importantly, blessed them in their struggle. Uh, like other people, Ajit was seized by the Pakistani militaries for interrogation. So um, he was brutally tortured by them. His mother was desperately looking for him because he, uh, she couldn't find her son. Uh, finally, she meets with him behind the bar at a prisoner's cell. He told his mother that the military will release him if he reveals the names of the other merchants who are in control like in the in their liberation war but her his mother was like uh told uh, told him that keep strong son don't tell anyone's name and the day ajat's mother gets to see him uh he was lying on a cold floor uh he could see uh 
he told her that he has not eaten rice for four days. Uh, the next day, his mother takes rice for her, her beloved son, but by the time the soldier have moved him to a location that no one knows of. After that day, Ajat's mother never uh, like was able to see her son. He never found his son, even the dead body of, his, of her son. So uh, from that day, Ajat's mother never ate rice, nor has she slept on a bed for the rest of her life. All 14 years of her disappearance, like his, her son's disappearance. She has hoped that uh, her son will come back one day until the death wipes it all away. But uh, after that day, she never found his, uh, her son. And uh, even in the end days of her life, she said to uh, write only the name of her son archived in her tombstone because she said that uh, her son's identity is enough for her. She doesn't need her husband's name there. So uh, her son was uh, uh, like a uh, martyr in the liberation war in Bangladesh and uh, her to tomb is still exist in Dhaka. So yeah. Okay, her do you wanna put, like all this, uh, is the book in English? Yeah, there is an English version. You would also find that too. Why don't you when put it in the chat? Yeah, because sure. I, I would like to start reading some of the books that you all read. I noticed, um, what, Dancing in the Mosque? Do you guys, do people know that book? Uh, it's about, anyway, if you wanna put some books in the chat that you would like me to read that they have to be in English and I can order them. But yeah, I would really like, right? Cause I've just been reading books mostly about American privileged women. And I really would like to read I would, you know, if I'm going to teach these students, I want to know what they read. I can't live their lives, but I would like to do that. So, um, May, what have you got? Okay, so um, I think I see that you meet her a good type in not only my mom, but also uh, many friends' mom I have. Like, because I think they all share the same, uh, the common thing, which is like they really love and nurture. Um, their children. They want all, all the best for children. But um, on the other hand, they also also have their kind of the nest empty syndrome, like you said in the text, and also the all controlling like problem. I think that because um, like Louis said before in Vietnam, like um, Vietnamese women have a lot of burdens. And also I was born in the middle part of Vietnam where a lot of stereotypes and expectations about women as a housewife and mother um, has, like, has existed for a long time. And I see that um, as a mother, my mother and also some other mother, like they want the best for us, like they want to reduce the burden for us. For example, they want us to stay at home so that uh, the mother can take care of us so that they can like, so that we can like do our work like better or something. But sometimes like some of them don't understand that like we still want to explore the world. We want to like learn something different. And we also want to do something like bigger than just like being at home or something like that. So um, sometimes we have the conflict kind of like that between like um, the, between many about many issues and it's a kind of a generation gap and also about the different in our thought kind of like that but um after all i still think that they they still care for us they love us and also they want the best for us it's just like the difference in our thought and also the generation gap but i still appreciate like the love of my mother and also um i can see that my friends also appreciate the love of their mom it's just like the difference, which is sometimes uh, hard to really like resolve. Yeah, kind of like that. Oh yeah, but it takes it, like it's your whole life trying to resolve it too. It doesn't go away real fast. <laughs> you don't just go, oh, I took care of that. <laughs> it's uh, just relationships are like that, so. Okay, uh, Jana Tool, what have you got? Okay, John. Professor, uh, 
not for today because my voice is because of cold. <clears throat> okay, so you have a cold. You could put something in the chat if you want to. Okay, um, okay Professor. Um, all right, Bina, what about you? Uh, yes, Professor. Um, uh, I have a story about a woman who is prostitute and mother. And there is a woman named called Rita, who is a prostitute and also a mother. I heard a, I heard her story when I was in uh, eighth grade, probably seven year, seven or eight years ago. Her story became very popular at the time and all over social medias. She told that she was abused by her stepfather when she was a child, and uh, she she grew a poor family, no father. When he told her about her stepfather, her mother blamed her instead of supporting her, thinking that she is a she's making up stories because she hates her stepfather. Since she since she grew up in a poor family, her father sold her in a Mumbai, India, to be in a prostitution field from many, and she became prostitute after that. She slept with many men and even got pregnant several times when she asked uh, those men if they can marry her. But they refused telling that they are also married. When she went to her hometown after many years, society didn't accept her. She was told characterless woman by her own family and society. And even boys from her village used to come to her and used to ask if they can have sex with her since she is a prostitute. Everyone treated her like a sex object, but she again got pregnant uh, with one of her child from customer but she didn't want to abort her she told she told that she wanted to her to be a mother because she is already in her 30s and she requested her guy that guy if she if he could marry her but again he refused but she didn't abort the child and she decided to take help from organizations and uh, ngos who fight for women right and she actually got out of uh, prostitution field with the help of many organizations. And now uh, she is a mother with the same child. She didn't abort her. She is raising her child without her husband and family. Uh, she is now a very hardworking, even though nobody supports her, support her. Her daughter told in one interview that she got neglected by her friends in school because she is a daughter of prostitute and no one, no one plays with her and want to be friends with her. Her mother faced the same criticism from the society, family, and friends, but still she tried to fulfill her needs, education by doing part-time jobs both day and night. She wanted her daughter to be educated and a strong woman in futures. Many schools refused her daughter to give an admissions because she was a prostitute daughter, but still she fought with them with the help of organizations. And she, her, she, she actually got one school who got who give an admission to her daughter she uh, as i've heard from people her daughter is now a doctor but i'm still not sure but uh, many when the, her story got out in out in show, all over the social, social media many people were actually praising her for being very hardworking and inspiring mother and people were saying that all mothers should think and do like her for these children hey, good. All right, Untari. Yes, Professor. Uh, for my example, I think about someone in my neighborhood. She was a mother and she was very overprotective towards her children. She doesn't even allow her children to try to walk by her own. Um, there is a tra uh, there is a tradition in Indonesia that if you touch your children's Food on earth, it will help them to be able to walk faster. I think it's a tradition to let the children to be more familiar with nature and environmental stuff. And this is why I think of her as a thing matter because of her protectiveness with her children. Okay, I um, when I was doing my PhD, my advisor, who's very accomplished, right? She has a good reputation, PhD in philosophy. She didn't let her high school son, she had to drive him to a certain part of town because she, she was afraid he'd get hurt. And my daughter was the same age 
and she was spending a year in Switzerland. <laughs> so it was crazy, right? Um, and she was really a happy mother and her children haven't done much. I think one of them has a bachelor's, but they live together in the house not far from her. And she goes and feeds them meals and, you know, works in their garden and everything. <laughs> and my kids are all over the world doing all this stuff. So it is kind of crazy. And it is, it's, I mean, the lesson there is how much people can affect whether a child develops their natural capacities, right? Mm. It's, it's sort of amazing how that happens, so. Okay, Rupia, what have you got? Hello, Professor. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah. My mother, I can say about my mother, my mother has the seven styles. I guess I can't hear you, um, but you could, again, you could put it in the chat and then I'll check it out while you're in your small groups. Um, is that okay, Rupia? Okay. Uh, Bondona, what have you got? Uh, Ma'am, uh, like I'm having internet issue. If I get breakdown, please do excuse me. Uh, like uh, um, I'll take an example of uh, in a Bollywood actor, but like uh, before she became the Bollywood actor, she was a prawn, uh, prawn actor. So like uh, she is a mother, uh, like uh, before she became a, she was a prawn actor. And after she came to the Bollywood world, uh, she, uh, she uh, brought, uh, got a lot of success in her life. And people, other people uh, hated her or, uh, and many people, loved her uh, because of her, uh, the love she had for her children behind the screen. Uh, she adopted a child uh, uh, and uh, she got, he got Professor, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Uh, uh, so uh, she married to a man, like, uh, hello? Yes, just go ahead, Bondona. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am, she uh, got married to a man and like they adopted a child, uh, a girl child, and like she was uh, spreading an awareness uh, like in India to like, uh, uh, for adopting a child, plus, uh, like after uh, after that, they after that, uh, she had uh, her own child, uh, two ch uh, two baby boy, and like and plus, uh, she is uh, uh, she loves her child. Uh, hello. Yes. Keep going. Okay, now I lost you. Okay, Bondona, you're on again. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Okay, Bondona, it's fine, but you can put it in the chat if you want. It's, we can hear you. Okay, Rossi, what you got? Hi, Professor. So uh, I'm going to talk about Lakshmi Dilbunrani. 
Hun San, and she's the first lady of Cambodia. She's the current first lady of Cambodia. And a bit about her background that relates to the meter is that after the Khmer Rouge, um, she resembles the meter because she plays a motherly role for the lives of so many children. She gathered children um, orphaned by the genocide and provide them with shelter, food, and care by creating orphanages for them. And then she makes sure that they receive proper education until they finish their studies and are able to work and survive on their own. And apart from that, she provides um, support to the poor and also to other women. Um, and also through her experience as a midwife, she has helped in delivering a lot of babies. And when we look back at her herself as an actual mother, she has six kids, uh, six um, children, and she takes care of them, even though she has a busy schedule and has to balance um, between her work as the president of the Red Cross and her work as a mother. She still makes sure that her children um, gets enough attention from her and she raised them to be independent and make sure that they are not um, spoiled because they live under the spotlight. Okay, very good. Um, all right, now we have our second round. Um, so I want to make sure everybody knows you have to bring two examples, right? One of somebody you know, one of someone in the spotlight. Then you have to have two works of art. One of, um, you know, hope, hopefully both of them from your country. Okay. Um, so Rupia says, uh, let's, let's check this out here. My mother has seven children. She's taking care of us well. I'm the eldest. She's always supporting me to stay positive about all my struggle. Um, she's taking care of my child so I can continue in school. Okay, very good. Um, another one has a best friend who's a mother um, and she takes care of her child. Um, she, her husband, okay, so she's gotten, she's gotten a lot heavier. Her husband didn't like that and got divorced. Uh, but she still keeps working, has to try and get ahead. Um, she doesn't need a man. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, all right. So all of you get caught, right, in all these different roles um, like the rest of us. Okay, so now we're going to look at some essays or some poems. All right, Poppy, what did you get? Professor, uh, I am, I will say later. Okay. All right. Um, Lakin. Lakin. Okay. Claire. Is this the work of art? Yes. Okay. I had a poem that I found online. I have the author, but I'll have to put it in the chat. But it's called Garden Walks with Demeter, and I'll just read it. Sure. Um, it says, yesterday in my garden, I met Demeter, bringing spring roses to bloom whilst I was wondering how powerful is my mother's love. And she planted a kiss on my forehead and answered, when Persephone, I may be butchering that name, but Persephone, my child was Persephone. stolen from me. I plunged the world into darkness. Not a flower was allowed to bloom or grow. When she returned, I brought the whole earth back to life, everything bathed in sunshine. That is what a mother's love can do. It can bring winter in all its fury or summer in all its purity. I just thought that that summed up just the power and the extremes that Demeter went to in her motherhood and her, how her emotions handled it. Okay, very good. Um, so I remember when we did the Athena and the father's daughter thing, and a lot of you were thinking, oh yeah, I guess I am close to my dad. Um, and now, you know, and then you thought about how that influenced you. And so now you can think about your mother's story. 
because when we go to Hesiod and Homer and Greek tragedy, especially Greek tragedy, family systems are really big. So try to keep all this in mind. Okay, Madeline, what have you got? Okay, so I actually I was going to use that exact same poem, The Garden Walks with Demeter from Nikki <laughs> Hill. Um, and I'm going to add a little on top of that. With that poem, it kind of shows the effects of mother with the motherhood as well. You know, you have your good times and you have your bad times, but you, like overall, you the love for your children is so powerful. Do you have a second one? Because everyone was supposed to bring two. I was trying to find a work of art but I couldn't really find a positive one. All I saw were like negative ones where like Demeter was lonely and like she was saddened because of the loss of her daughter. So I, I was trying to find a positive one, but I wasn't able to. Well, actually, I mean, you know, it's okay to find a negative one because that's, that's the story of what patriarchy did to her, right? Um, right. So when that story, I don't know if you got, were struck by that, by Hades saw her and took her into the underworld, right? Raped and abducted her. And Demeter went to Zeus. And it turns out Zeus had given him permission to do that, right? That's so outrageous. And that's what made her so mad, right? And so when you think about that, I don't, I don't know if it happens in developing countries anymore. But for a while there, there were arranged marriages, right? Some old guy who had money could pick some young girl and make a, a deal with the father, right? If you let me marry her, then I'll, you know, provide for you. The, the fiddler on the roof story is about that. So in a lot of ways, you know, fathers sell out their daughters and marry them off to people that they don't want to be married to, they don't want to have sex with. Um, and on the one hand, you could say, well, poverty does that to people. But on the other hand, you know, it also is considered socially acceptable, right? Or um, even promoted. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really sketchy. <laughs> poverty is poverty, but how come women have to suffer so much? Okay, so um, Louis, what you got? Uh, yes, professor. Yep. Um, I got uh, the example of a song. You see one of the most popular song about Vietnamese mom. His name is Mom's Diary. Um, the, the whole song depict the quiet sacrifice of mother in six section, six state. Like it starts from when mom is pregnant and goes to the mom when, when she gives birth and raise a baby. Then the baby then start going to school and that child falls in love for the very first time. Eventually, like that child grow up and leave their mom. Uh, finally, the mom is like very old and hoping that he will come back. Uh, the figure of the mothers where the song cover a very like long period of time from the you from the young mother to the mom in the old age uh, the last happy woman in her life like my like seeing her children become mature successful and coming back after so many years apart um every event in her child life he held deeply in her mind and each day she played that collection of events at a film of her son, like in which she will remember and it, she appeared in that film. Okay, what was the name of the film? Um, I'm this is a, a on the on the song in the on official oh. video of the song. Yeah, they played the the only event of the mother and the son throughout the song. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Arifa, what have you got? Do you have something, Arifa? Yeah, Professor. I want to uh, talk about one song. Uh, I want to sing this song. It's about mother. 
that she is working very hard about uh, their children uh, and taking care of them, but in trying their best to take care of her children and uh, support them to get education, but uh, she doesn't have any husband to work for them, but uh, she is uh, very hard work and always uh, Okay, we lost you. Um, do you can think you, Can you hear me, Professor? Now I can. Go yes, ahead. Professor. Go ahead. All right, so you'll have to put it in the um, chat. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth, what you got? Um, I also brought a song. It's called Slipping Through My Fingers. And you see it in the movie Mamma Mia. And I'm, I'm not sure if Abba composed it originally or if it was composed specifically for the movie, but um, it's about how a mother's love doesn't end when the child like moves away or gets married or something and it's basically just talking about like the wonderful times that the mother and child had together and how the mother will always remember this because this child is everything to her um i think i saw an excerpt of that movie were they like doing girly things together maybe polishing their nails or something yeah the daughter's about to get married so she's like doing her daughter's hair and painting her toenails and helping her get dressed and all that kind of stuff okay because you know I left my daughter I had to leave her in ninth grade and I remember just a few years ago seeing that and I said to her oh Erica I've never done girly stuff like that. Maybe we should do that. She goes, mom, you're not that kind of a mom. Forget it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, it is hard. Um, because if kids really needed that, it's, that's the thing about parenting. Like they need everything and there's no way you can give them everything. And it's really hard to figure out what you're missing and how to fill in the gaps, especially if you move 700 miles away. So anyway, yeah, okay. I, that just occurred to me. Um, Sam, what have you got? Um, for the artwork, I decided to do the movie uh, Cinderella. <laughs> okay. um, and you could use a few of the, the two mother figures for sure for this, but um, I wanted to focus more on the biological mom before she passes because in the live action version, they show a little bit of the relationship with her and Cinderella. Um, and she was very caring and kind and instructive and she always wanted her daughter to feel protected and loved. And um, so I thought that she was a really good representation of Demeter. And now the stepmom is evil and rude and cruel and so she would be, she's just evil. So she'd be a really bad representation of Demeter as a mother. She doesn't have any of Demeter's um, qualities in her, so, but. Okay, there is that stereotype of the mean stepmom, right? And um, some stepmothers really are like that, but my sister married a guy with four kids and they kept making her into the mean stepmom and she wasn't. And they were really nasty to her because they really still wanted their dad to, re to go back, right, to, his, to their mom. So they really punched her buttons a lot. <laughs> and so, so it is complicated. You know, sometimes they'll put you in this box of being the mean stepmom and they try to trigger you so that you actually are like that. So my sister really did a nice job of avoiding that and, and they really like her. She saved a lot of them, two of them had depression and she told them 
You don't have to make money. You can study poetry. You can be a second grade teacher. You can take philosophy because his family is super rich um, and through business. And they all felt like they had to be in business. And, and two of them were depressed about it. So my sister is really, she's a really good stepmom. <laughs> That's but good, yeah. When I saw how she, I just felt like I would never have the patience that she has, right? Like my sister and I are really different. And she has a real gift for people, right? And I don't. And so she and I are really different, but we like each other a lot, right? And she's smart. It's like the road not taken. She had to choose between all these relationships or academics. And, you know, I had to, my family stuff got really weird because of academics. So it was an interesting story. And the reason I'm saying this is probably the rest of you will have a complicated life like this, right? Uh, especially since your parents want you, right, to juggle things. It, it's tricky, but uh, it's worth it, so. Okay, Jereen, go ahead. Do you wanna go, Jereen? Okay, Nahida. All right. Yes, Professor. Uh, actually, uh, I want to talk about the Jahanara Imam. He's a, she's a Bangladeshi writer and political activist. She has been called, a, called as Shahid Janani, that means mother of martyred freedom fighter. During the liberation war of Bangladesh, she, she, she lost her children in the war. Uh, as she loved, uh, but she loved her children very much, but because of uh, country's uh, purpose, she, uh, she also loved her country as well. So she sacrificed her children for country. And, and um, at last, uh, in the last, she wrote books, many books, about the history of liberation war and her child, how she loved her child, how she used to bring up her child and how he lost her child. Actually, those stories are very saddest story. Whenever I was reading, just uh, it seems like she's a mother and she's, she know that she, her children will die in the liberation war and she's just inspiring her children. It's actually, actually great history. I get inspired from her. Is it in English? Okay, Nahida, if I can get it in English, you can put it in the chat. Okay, go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll write it down later on. Um, Newsrat, what about you? Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, I read a poem. Um, the name of the poem is Mother, which is by Nikita Gill. Oh, it's a short okay. poem, um, seven lines. I can't read it out, should I? Sure, actually, did I tell you last year, um, um, Chardine, uh, anyway, one of my students had that same, she really likes that same author, and so I went and bought that. Oh, okay. I really sure. like it, but go ahead. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> The water of her womb, your first home, the body she pulled apart to welcome you to the world, the spirit in you she helped to grow uh, with all she knew, the heart that she gave you when yours fell apart. You are her soft miracle, so she gave you her eyes to see the best in the worst. You carry your mother in your eyes, make her proud of all she watches you do. Okay, so that's the poem. Uh, this poem, uh, I really like this poem because it illustrates so beautifully the loving and giving nature of a woman. And uh, our mothers uh, like provide us with our first home. They give us their hearts and their love, and we carry them with us forever. I especially love the last two lines of this piece because like a mother's love um, can be an eternal gift to us. No matter what happens, they are with us always in the things we do and the decisions we make. Uh, they are there in the spirit and their love transcends the physical to guide us always. So, yeah. Okay, 
So I did want to point out to you that I did send you the book that has all the excerpts that all of you have sent so far. So that Google Classroom stream, you're not required to read it, but if you'd like to read it, you know, I think it's inspiring. So many of you, you know, have really great stories and then you have good examples. So I will just keep adding that um, each week. And you can pick whatever you like if you want to read it. Okay, May. Um, okay, I think of a poem in Vietnam. Like, um, it doesn't have the translation version and it's really hard to translate it. But basically, um, the author talks about his grandmother and about the kitchen's atmosphere. Like, um, the author wrote it uh, when, when he was like 19 years old um starting abroad in russia but he remembered like the whole story the whole poem is about his grandmother like when he was um four years old like in 2000 and around 2000 and like um night sorry like about sorry about 19 and 40 1945 in vietnam when we had a uh, you know of famine like a famine like a, an extreme famine um after the um war with crunch kind of like that and many people also died because of hunger and at that time like his parents like lived far from him like working and like fighting for the country kind of like that and he spent like the whole life like, living with his grandmother and his grandmother is like both the father and the mother like uh, she raised him up like cooked for him and also like even taught him how to study kind of like that and he when he studied abroad he needed to um so you, as he needed to like live far from his grandmother and all of the memories inside him is just about like grandmother and i think that um this poem like made me think of like the demeter archetype in many people like not just only in mother especially in vietnam i think that um usually we are close to the um grandmother and grandfather a lot like because we live in often live in an extended family and grandmother and grandfather they live uh, they love us and also like really care about us and also it gives me the feeling of like a bit like how to say that like a bit scared because like maybe in the future i like many beloved people of me will like maybe will not be here anymore and like i think that it would be a, an extreme loss for me so i think that this um poem is interesting and very like meaningful in many way kind of like that very good um rossi do you have your hand up okay. oh my dear my hands up but i do want to share okay can we just go in the in the normal yeah sure yeah okay because i i, I want to make i want to make sure to cover everybody and okay, okay. As, asbina do you have something or did i already call on you Asbina, are you there? Okay, Untari. Pass, Professor. Pass. Can I write a book? I can't understand you very well. So maybe you should type it in the chat. Is that okay? Um, Jana Tool, do you have something? Okay, Margia. How about you, Margia? Do you have something? Okay. All right. Um, Rossi. Um, sorry for the <laughs> internet problem. So I do have a song to share. It's a Cambodian song. 
um, it's Pompey Madai, and in English, the closest translation I could think of is Soothing Mother, and just like what Loi share, this song also represents the cycle of what a mother does in her life for her kid since the time she was pregnant to the time she was old. And so from the start of the musical video, we can see how much the mother has endured. She's a single mother and she works under the sun in the farm, trying to raise enough money and everything to support the kids. She takes care of them emotionally and mentally. And then um, whenever they get hurt, she's always there to protect them. And she supports them until they're able to pursue higher education. And then when she's older, she just longs for them to be happy and be able to be by her side. Okay, good. Um, where are we? Nahida? Professor? Mm -hmm. You have something? I'm asking me. All right, Rupia. Rupia, do you have anything? Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to put you into groups and I'm going to try to switch you around so that there aren't too many whose internet isn't working very well. Um, now, I know that there's been a huge snowstorm where I live and it might be on my end that the problem is. Um, not sure though. Margia, are you connected? Nope. Okay, so I'll put you in groups and for 15 minutes and um, let me know, you know, if almost nobody is connected, come back to me and tell me because we might just get to the point where we're gonna have bigger and bigger groups until um, I will just be quiet and whoever has a second example of anything and still has an internet connection can present. But for now, I'll start you out in three different groups. And just let me know if there's too many, um, too many people whose stuff, whose internet is not working. Um, Hi, Rupia. Geez, it's too many, too many US. Oh, come on. Uh, oops. Ugh. Okay, sorry, Madeline. Hmm. 
I think it's crazy. Like we gotta figure out common sense. Okay, so, all right, <laughs> maybe it's better that that wasn't recorded, but okay, so the main points, what is the place of the arts in helping change people's consciousness so that then they will go about changing the laws and the institutions, right? So okay. when first, do you change the laws and people's consciousness change or do the artists change people's mindsets, their hearts, what they desire, what they envision? And then the other things start to change. So culture is this way. It's like this big feedback loop where everything feeds in. So uh, I guess the other thing I said is we're starting to realize how difficult it is for women to juggle all this stuff, that what's expected of a man, marriage, kids, career, is almost impossible for a woman, right? And we've got to figure out, we've got to stop that. So by the time you all are my age, I'm sure there will be a lot of progress made. And I want you to be at the forefront of this progress. Um, expect that the life you're going to have is different. And so that's why reading novels, reading stories where women imagine a different world, a different way to treat people and all that is is good art is really can be very educational okay madeline did you have a question no ma'am no oh that's no, my, my hand <laughs> i just happen to have the cursor right over your your square i want to leave yeah it's time to go so okay i will stop the recording now and I will um, stay here if anyone wants to talk to me, okay? Okay, thank you, Professor. Bye-bye.